Today's scripture lesson is particularly, well, all scripture lessons are particularly apropos, but as far as the present climate of outrage and argumentation and accusation that, that we are bombarded with every day, uh, we, we need to remember that the preacher says in Ecclesiastes, there is no new thing under the sun. And Paul, writing to the Ephesians uh, almost 2,000 years ago, says these verses in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Read with me as we hear from the word of our great God. This is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Those who steal must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor, doing good work with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice for God. The word of God. Thanks be to the Lord. Talking about anger. Uh, uh, for many years, I was the city solicitor of the city of Bluefield. Uh, Bluefield's uh, city fathers, uh, when they formed the charter, uh, they admired the corporate form of government. So Bluefield has a, a uh, board of directors and not a town council. Uh, the, the lawyer for the city was called the city solicitor uh, rather than the city attorney. And my partners at my private law firm took great delight in pointing out to me whenever they saw a no soliciting sign that I wasn't to do city business on, on their time. But the city solicitor is appointed by the board of directors to be the particular servant and counselor to the board of directors. And uh, so when there are times of negotiation, the city solicitor is usually asked to tag along. Bluefield has a bit of a history of um, marvelous projects which are going to be a game changer, everything's going to be better, good times are going to be here again. We're working on one right now and tearing down the, uh, the downtown. Uh, years before that, it, uh, Lorica and Intuit were going to uh, be the salvation. Uh, before that, the Omnis factory, which we hope to get started one day, was going to be a great game changer. About every five years, we have these great projects. About 30 or 35 years ago, there was a project to be called the, the, the Bluefield Towers, the city towers. And we were going to knock down part of downtown, not the, town, not the part we're knocking down now, but another part, and we're going to build two enormous uh, towers, one as a convention center and one as a fancy hotel. And so we got grant money, and I'm saying we, the corporate we, Bluefield, uh, we got grant money and we, we did request for proposals and got a proposal from a contractor, a developer, project manager out of, out of Pennsylvania. And we were to, to condemn and knock down all the old buildings and build this new uh, proposal. And, and things started off with a great bang, all these newspaper political uh, publicity about how things are going to be wonderful. And uh, as it went on, the, the developer seemed to lose his enthusiasm. And, and so, uh, after a number of unsatisfactory communications, finally, the mayor at the time, Don Keesling, who was the mayor of Bramall uh, in his younger days, and then the mayor of Bluefield uh, about 35 years ago, uh, got together several members of his staff, the development director, me as city solicitor, and we were going to go up to Pennsylvania and see the project that he was managing there and talk to him about getting the stalled Bluefield Towers project off the dime. And Don was a pretty good negotiator. He ran the theaters here for many years, and 
And um, we sort of did what's called a good cop, bad cop routine. Uh, Don and the development director was going to be accusational and directive, and you said you'd do this and you haven't, you said this would happen now and it hasn't. And I was to say, oh no, he's trying, aren't you trying, Mr. Developer? This will all work out well. And w when we got up there, the, the guy was a, if I weren't in a Christian church, I'd use other words, but I, I guess a glib con man is a, is a good way to say it. And he took us around as if we were the visiting firemen from way out in the sticks and showed us all these things and said, could Bluefield be accustomed to this kind of luxury? Aren't your people not quite the sort of people that this would be? And I lost my temper and tore into him. Uh, I, I don't want to say that I called him a glib con man, but it was pretty close. And, and so the meeting broke up in disorder and we returned back to Bluefield. And uh, Don had noticed me kind of flying off the handle a time or two. Uh, and, and so he, he counseled me, he said, John, he said, let me tell you a story. He said, when I was a little boy at Bramble Elementary, there was another little boy who used to beat me up. And so I came home and complained to my, my grandmother that this other little boy was beating me up. And she said, Donnie, Remember, the Bible says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. And so I went back to the school the next day, and I was just as nice as I could be, that little boy, and he beat me up anyway. And so I came back and I said, Granny, I was nice to him, and he beat me up. And you said, a soft answer turneth away wrath. And she said, your wrath, Donnie, not his wrath. No sense both of you being mad. And that stuck with me forever. I find in my professional career, when I get mad and do something, I make a mistake. And the madder I am, the worse the mistake can be. Now, the Apostle Paul isn't saying, don't be angry when he writes to the, to the, to the Ephesians. What he's saying is, be angry, but do not sin and don't let the sun go down on your anger. Different set of things entirely. Now. This makes us think that the Apostle Paul is talking about two kinds of anger. One, justifiable anger, and two, not justifiable anger, the, the anger that leads to sin and is in fact sin itself. The, we are in a hot boiling pot of political anger at this time in, in our country. We are so mad at each other uh, all of us remember the uh, politics of our youth, and we read American history and the politics there, and it has never been a you know, pity-pat sort of uh, contest. Always people have said terrible things about one another. And now the rage seems to be amplified by these limbs of the devil we carry around in our pocket, our, our cell phones and, and the internet. And, and you can't turn on the television without people, you know, bugging their eyes out at you, spitting saliva, and going red face, and being just absolutely furious about the other people who are on the other side of the political uh, circumstance for them. And uh, this is a no partisan type affair. Everybody's mad at everybody. And so the, 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 that is a time when, as Christians, we have particular obligations that we need to keep in mind. Because if we don't, how are they going to know that we're Christians? I, I, I heard a story of, a, of a, a police officer in an unmarked car. And, and he, was, he was following a car in front of him. And the car in front of him wasn't doing anything illegal, but it was roaring up in one lane, jumping over in another lane, uh, running up the other side, then jumping back into another lane, making people slam on the brakes and, and uh, not using a signal. And, um, honking at somebody who was too, too slow at a stoplight. And, and finally the, the officer pulled over the car and, and went forward and, and asked for the driver's license and insurance and registration card. And then the, 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 the driver said, why did you stop me? I wasn't doing anything wrong. And the, the cop said, no, but you had these Christian stickers on the back and the way you were driving, I thought the car might be stolen. <laughs> and so, we have to know that the way we act shows what we believe. Uh, we, we see people wearing little gold hooks in their lapels, little gold fishes. Well, I guess not lapels these days. It, it's well known, by the way, that you cannot preach in a Presbyterian church without wearing a suit and a tie. 
that's a joke. Uh, but I, I find as a lawyer, when somebody comes in my office and say, I'm a Christian and I, I put my hand on my wallet because I'm kind of afraid that there's going to be a whopper coming right out and there has to be some reinforcement in front so I will be able to buy into whatever the story they're, they're retailing. And we don't want to be that guy. We don't want to be that gal. We want to be completely different. Now, the idea of Christianity as a perfectly calm, perfectly peaceful, perfectly pacifist uh, religion is a mistaken idea. The, uh, the Old Testament is, has oh, about a hundred instances referring to the wrath of God. The, the wrath of God uh, is the uh, concept, let's take Moses for example. Now, now we all believe that our precious Holy Bible is the Word of God, that it is an inerrant Word of God. When correctly translated, it is a perfect rule for our life and our circumstances. Recall how God wrote the Bible. Now, God did write by his own agency the Ten Commandments on the stones of the law that were lost when the Babylonians uh, destroyed Jerusalem in the, the 6th century B.C. And, and the Ark of the Covenant containing the tablets was lost. Otherwise, God acted through the Holy Spirit, inspiring the people who actually wrote down his holy words. Now, let's talk about Moses. Moses was a brilliant man. Moses was brought up in the Egyptian court. That probably meant that Moses was literate. We know that he probably spoke both Hebrew, which is his birth family and who actually were his foster family, and his Egyptian family, which was the royal house of the of the, the daughter of Pharaoh. And so he probably wrote and read and spoke Egyptian and Hebrew both. Now, when God inspires Moses to write down the Pentateuch, because we, we believe uh, that, that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. Probably he didn't write the part where he died, but he, he, he wrote the rest of it. And when God inspired him to write that down. He inspired Moses with visions of things that had happened before the life of Moses. He inspired Moses to write down Moses' understanding in the language he used, in the concepts he used. He didn't write it in French or English or German or Latin. He wrote it in Hebrew and wrote it down as he understands it. So. We are human beings. We are imperfect creatures. And, and our Lord God tells us that his ways and his thoughts are as far above us as the heavens are above the earth. And so when he inspires the writers of the Bible to write things down, he writes down Christianity and Judaism 101 for dummies because sisters, brothers, boy, we are. And so he writes down the concepts, and we, we have difficulty with words for God. Uh, I will say, and every pastor supplying this pulpit will say, God, he, God, his, uh, God's words, he does that, he does this. It is equally correct to say, God, she. We don't do it because it's shocking culturally to us. But, but God, the Westminster Confession, um, tells us that God is a spirit without passions or parts. And God doesn't, I love our southern phrase, fly mad. You know, when you talk about so-and-so flew mad, you have this, this, this feeling of this outraged, bany rooster flying up and squawking and flapping its wings. God doesn't ever do that. I'm, I'm going to give you, I, I, I have a temptation to use 50 cent words, and this is a dollar 50 cent word. Theology teaches that God is impassable. That means God is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. God doesn't change. We even have a hymn about that, Great is Thy Faithfulness, where the, where the hymn writer wrote, Great is Thy Faithfulness, Thy compassions, Thou changest not, Thou compassions, they fail not. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And that's our Lord God. Now, when we sin, 
God doesn't get mad at us and say, oh, J.W., I saw what you did and here comes the lightning bolt. You know, it is my sin is repellent to the holiness of God. Uh, I like to use the phrase of magnets. If you take a north pole and a south pole of a magnet and try to push them together, you can't because the magnetic attraction repulses the north and south polarity. And in that way, our sin shoves us away from the holiness of God, not because God is smoked with us, but because his holiness, his purity, rejects the way we act. And so when Moses writes down the wrath of God, he doesn't mean that God gets up in the morning and there's a heretical sect that believed that God is a flesh and blown God, gets up in the morning, smells the coffee, gets mad or gets happy. But the, the Lord God we believe in is always the same. And when you see the wrath of God in the Old Testament, it is not the fickle wrath of some heretical pagan Near Eastern deity that gets mad and jealous and upset. It is God considering the sin of the world before he visits the flood on the antediluvian world. God thinking again and again, that, I'm, I'm using those same improper terms, God's consideration of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and whether there can be any just people found there before comes down punishment upon them. And so that's the kind of anger we're talking about. It's not fickle, it's not personal, it is the majesty of the Lord in his pure holiness that results in the wages of sin being death for us, unforgiven sin. Now, the, the Jesus kind of wrath, uh, the, the Bible tells us, uh, Hebrews tells us, that, that Jesus was prone to every emotion that humans feel. He was like us in every way, except that he did not sin. Now, every emotion that we have, Jesus had, and Jesus acted on it. I am always stricken by the idea of Jesus being some lily-white wuss with a limp wrist. And now, Jesus clearly says in Matthew, this is Matthew 5, 38-4, you have heard it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But anyone who slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If they want your shirt, hand over your coat as well. That sounds like pacifism. You know, our, uh, our, our grandmother was profoundly deaf. And so when we, Betsy and I and the brothers come running in from playing around in the farm and say, Mamma, Mamma, if this happened, that happened, she'd say, that's nice, dear. She didn't hear us. And we realized that finally. And so we'd come in and say, Mama, Mama, Mark fell out of the apple tree and broke his leg and the barn's on fire. And she'd say, that's nice, dear. Now, that's kind of the idea that some people have of the Lord Jesus Christ, that everything was nice, everything was okay, and he was always turning the other cheek. Not so. Our Lord Jesus got mad. And not only he got mad, he did things about it. If, if, if you look at the... The, uh, this was probably a setup. Uh, Jesus had gone into the synagogue. This is on a Sabbath day. And, and on a Sabbath day, pious Jews can't work. And they have a whole long list of things they can't do that are work things. And, and so they bring a guy forward who steps forward and he has a withered hand. And the Bible doesn't say, but I, I, my suspicious lawyer's conniving mind thinks it was probably a plant that the, that the Pharisees brought this guy in there to see what Jesus would do on the Sabbath. And so Mark tells us what happens. This is, this is Mark 3, verses 1 through 6. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand came in. And they looked for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he could heal the man with a shriveled hand. Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? They remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed with their stubborn hearts. He said, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Herodians plotted how they might kill Jesus. 
Jesus was angry at their stubborn hearts and their so being had bound by their rules that good works shouldn't be got done on the Sabbath, according to them. Now, we are all familiar, of course, with, the, with, with, with Jesus in the temple. Uh, twice, early in, his, early in his preaching career, late in his preaching career, he goes to the temple, and the, the temple was set up, enormous temple platform. Uh, the front part of it was called the Court of the Gentiles, where people who weren't Jews could come and, and make sacrifice and worship and buy it. And you got to think about how that sounded and smelled, uh, the, the, because there were there were booths and tables to change money. You couldn't use just any money as an offering. You had to buy the the, the, the temple the, the temple money. You, you, you were you, you there. You could buy your sacrifices. And this is in the Near East. People don't change a whole lot. And you can just conceive of in the holy temple, the court of the Gentiles, in the, in the temple at Jerusalem where the Jews believed the presence of God hovered over the table of shewbread and the, and the Ark of the Covenant. Hey, get your lambs here, lambs without a blemish. Mohammed has the best, we wouldn't say Mohammed at that time, Isaac has the best prices on the lambs, and uh, best change money, best rates, yelling and calling out at the passers-by, shoving forth their, their sacrifices. And Jesus is absolutely burned up by that. He says, it is written, my house, God's house, my house shall be a house of prayer for all people, and you have made it a den of thieves. And you know what he did? He reaches over cords lying on one of the table, probably to tie the doves or tie up the lambs or something for the sacrifice. He grabs them, he turns them into a twist, and he absolutely lays into those people. It wasn't, uh, here, smite me on this cheek, um, uh, 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 Joseph. Smite me on that cheek, uh, um, Isaac. He, he absolutely lays into them in righteous, holy indignation to cleanse his temple. Now, you know, the disciples didn't just sit there and say, oh, look at Jesus go. They probably piled in too. I'm interpolating a lot, but I think you can by knowing the way people act. And he cleans out the temple, did it twice. Early in his preaching career, uh, late in his in his preaching career, and it was that late time that the Pharisees decided we got to kill him. We got to kill him. So Jesus's anger is devoted to people whose hearts are so stubborn they do not hear the word of God, and whose practices dishonor and discredit and demean the worship of God. And so in those areas, he's he's ripe for his anger now. Hebrews tells us he was angered, but he did not sin. Where does that anger come down to us? We all know about Karens. Uh, every, every woman I know named Karen, by the way, is, is, a, is a lovely woman and, uh, and an admirable woman. Uh, but you know the theme where Karen is being used as a somebody who has this absolutely perfect haircut and and, and the food's late or cold or the, offers or the order is wrong or somebody's taking too long or somebody's where they shouldn't be. Absolutely unappeasable and fussy. I think the male version of that is a Chad. But the, that person is a person who shows their deep insecurity and deep unhappiness and lets everybody else share it too. That's bad anger. Good anger is anger, I, I love the old congressman who used to call it good trouble, but the good anger is anger against the things that anger our Lord God's perfect nature and our Lord Jesus' way he lived his life. And it's anger against sin. It's anger against social injustice. It's anger against the drug epidemic and those who push the drugs and the the men and women in suits of beautiful clothes at boardrooms who, who, who make plans as to how to sell more addictive painkillers to southern West Virginia and eastern Kentucky and, and, and the, the plague that, 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 that afflicts us today. It's anger against those poor people, those <coughs> young men and women who you see in the, in, the, in the beauty of their youth, and then you see them five years later, and they look like they've been standing out in the desert wind for all that time. It eats them alive. We pay the consequences in, in theft um, and, and uh, burglary and, and disorder. 
Uh, West Virginia has 6,000 children in foster care, and you read about the foster care problems, and, and you, you're angry about that. Who will save those children? We, we read about our legislature being unable to pass the, the Medicare, Medicaid wa waiver problem, requiring some of the um, group homes to, sh to, to, to shut down. Uh, we see the, the results of addiction. This church, praise God, has been able to be a shelter for the recovery community for many years, and praise God, may it always continue until there's no need for it anymore. Uh, we, we, we know about hunger. The, these days it's called food insecurity, as if you make a, uh, an official sociological term and it doesn't sound quite so bad as hunger in the richest nation in the world. We have a blessing box out front that people depend on and use and come for their food. Those are the things we get angry about. Racial prejudice is still with us, like that coiled snake in our bosoms. And, and that's the thing we are to be angry about, and a constructive anger. But, but, don't let it make you be that guy or that gal who is on the boil all the time. You know, you're angry at the situation, you're angry at the, at the sin, but not the sinner, but it doesn't poison your life so you don't say it every second word is, well, that daggone and that jerk and that so-and-so and that so are bad. You don't want to be that guy or that gal. You want to be a servant of Jesus Christ, angry only with righteous anger against those things which our Lord tells us we should be angry about. And he gives us, through our faith, first forgiveness for our unrighteous anger, because I, I wish I could tell you I've never been unrighteously angry since, angry since Donnie Kiesling uh, laid me out. But uh, he forgives us for our own sins and gives us the strength to be constructively angry against the things we should be angry. Praise his holy name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, uh, we praise you for these examples of you in all of your humanness, confronting situations that needed confrontation, unbound by no rules but your own holy, glorious, pure nature. We praise you for the example. We ask you to give us the example and the strength and the knowledge to follow it. In thy holy name, in the name of thy risen Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.